The citric acid cycle consists of eight individual steps and so far we discussed the first four steps of the citric acid cycle. Now let's move on and discuss the remaining four steps. So in this lecture, we're going to focus on steps five, six, seven, and eight of the citric acid cycle. So remember that in step four, we synthesize a molecule known as succinyl coenzyme A. And this is the same molecule that is used as the reactant in step number five. Now, in this reaction, this is actually the only step of the citric acid cycle in which we generate a high energy purine nucleoside triphosphate molecule. We generate a GTP. So what we ultimately want to do in this process is we want to attach a phosphoryl group onto the GDP, the guanosine diphosphate, to form the guanosine triphosphate GTP. The problem with carrying out this step is it requires an input of energy. So the process by which we attach the PI onto the GDP to form the GTP is an endergonic process. And so we actually have to undergo some other process that is exergonic to basically couple this endergonic process. Now remember one important fact about succinyl coenzyme A and generally speaking in the citric acid cycle whenever we see a thioester bond between the carbon and the sulfur of the coenzyme A molecule that bond shown in red is a very unstable high in energy bond. In fact when we cleave this bond, that will release a certain amount of free energy. And that free energy that is released when we cleave this bond is basically used to drive the attachment of this molecule onto the GDP to form the GTP. In the process, we also release that coenzyme A and form this four carbon succinate molecule that will go on to react in step six of the citric acid cycle. And this, this reaction is uh, this reaction is catalyzed by succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. Now, once we form the GTP molecule, the GTP is generally used for two purposes. They can either be used by G proteins. For instance, we saw that in signal transduction pathways, we have G proteins and the G proteins utilize the GTP molecule. And so we can use it for that specific purpose. Or the GTP can actually be transformed into ATP. How? Well, by the action of an enzyme known as nucleoside diphosphokinase. This enzyme actually catalyzes the transfer of a phosphoryl group from the GTP onto an ADP to form the ATP and this GDP. So in this process, we utilize the GTP formed in step five of the citric acid cycle to generate ATP molecules that can be used by a variety of processes inside our body. So once again, we see that the unstable and high in energy thioester bond in succinyl coenzyme A is cleaved to release the coenzyme A and also release free energy. And that free energy is then used to power the endergonic process of attaching a phosphoryl group onto the GDP to form the GTP. And this is catalyzed by succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. Now, before we move on to the next several steps, let's actually discuss what the reaction mechanism is of this process. So what actually takes place in the active site of this enzyme. So let's focus on the following five diagrams to basically answer that question. In diagram one, we basically have the inorganic orthophosphate that goes into the active site along with the succinyl coenzyme A. So we have the succinyl coenzyme A, we have the orthophosphate. And notice the GDP is not found in this location. In fact, the GDP is found nearby, but not in the same location. And we'll see what happens in the final two steps that allows us to actually bring that orthophosphate to that GDP. So in the first step, what happens is the inorganic orthophosphate actually acts as a nucleophile. It attacks the carbon of this carbonyl, breaking this unstable bond, and that releases that coenzyme A. And it forms an intermediate molecule known as succinyl phosphate. So in step one, we displace the coenzyme A, we release the coenzyme A from the active site, and so we produce this product in step one. Once we form the succinyl phosphate, 
Within the active site of this enzyme, we have a specific catalytic histidine residue that basically catalyzes the next step. And so the two electrons of the nitrogen of this catalytic histidine residue basically act as a nucleophile attacking the P atom and that breaks this sigma bond and so that detaches this entire four carbon component and now the carbon basically gains the oxygen and we form this succinate molecule here. Now, once we undergo step two, we form the succinate and the coenzyme A. So coenzyme A is formed in step one, while the succinate is formed in step two. And once we form this intermediate, this is known as phosphohistidine. And notice we cannot stop here. For one thing, we still haven't formed the GTP. Another thing though is we have to regenerate that original catalytic residue because remember enzymes are always regenerated after the reaction. We cannot actually use up our enzymes. And so in step three what happens, this phosphohistidine basically swings over to another site within our enzyme and that site contains a GDP. And now in step for the GTP receives the orthophosphate from this histidine residue to basically form that GTP and also regenerate that original catalytic histidine residue that is found in the active side of the enzyme. So we see that in this process, in step one, we form the coenzyme A. In step two, we form the succinate. In steps three and four, we form the GTP molecule. So let's move on to step six, seven, and eight, the final three steps of the citric acid cycle. So these are our three steps. Now remember that the citric acid cycle began with an oxalo, uh, oxaloacetate intermediate. And because the citric acid cycle is literally a cycle, so if we begin with an oxaloacetate, what that means is we have to end up with that same oxaloacetate. And so what this process involves is in these three steps, six, seven, and eight, we transform the four carbon succinate into the four carbon oxaloacetate. And so the only difference between these two molecules is on this region, we have a methylene group, a CH2 component, but on this region of the oxaloacetate, we have a carbonyl component. And so we see that what happens in this three-step process is we basically, uh, we basically transform the methylene group on the succinate into the oxaloacetate that contains a carbonyl group. In the process, we also extract, we abstract high energy electrons by the carrier NAD plus as well as FAD. So remember, FAD is flavin adenine dinucleotide that is able to obtain two H atoms. While the NAD plus is a carrier, nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide, that is able to obtain hydride ions. So a single hydride ion that contains two electrons on that H ion. So that's the difference between these two molecules. In step six, we use FAD. In step eight, we use NAD plus. Now let's focus on step six. In step six, we have the succinate dehydrogenase enzyme that catalyzes the step. And so what happens is these two H atoms and each one of these H atoms contains one electron each are abstracted from the succinate. Those two electrons left over form a double bond, a pi bond, and so we form the fumarate that contains the double bond between these two carbons. And these two H atoms then bind onto the carrier flavin adenine dinucleotide to form the FADH2. Now, one important fact that you have to know about succinate dehydrogenase is, unlike the enzymes that we discussed so far, this enzyme, succinate dehydrogenase, is actually part of the inner mitochondrial matrix. In fact, it's an iron sulfur protein that is also part of the electron transport chain. So what actually happens is, when the FAD, be, well, first of all, the FAD is covalently attached onto the succinate dehydrogenase, but 
once this uh, reaction takes place, once this oxidation reaction takes place and we reduce the FAD into the FADH2, that FADH2 that is formed remains attached covalently onto the succinate dehydrogenase. And once we form this, what it does is it donates those two electrons onto a special iron sulfur component of the enzyme and those two electrons then move on along the other proteins of the electron transport chain and that generates a proton gradient that allows us to form ATP molecules and we'll focus on that, on that much more in a future lecture. So ultimately, we oxidize the succinate into the fumarate and we reduce the FAD into FADH2. So once again, step six is an oxidation reduction reaction that oxidizes the succinate into the fumarate while abstracting those H atoms. So the ions along with the pair of electrons to form that FADH2. Now, succinate dehydrogenase, the enzyme that catalyzes step six, is bound to the inner mitochondrial membrane, and it is an iron sulfur protein. That means it contains these iron sulfur groups that can basically abstract those electrons. Now, the FAD is actually covalently bound to that particular enzyme. And when the FAD gains those two H atoms, it becomes the FAD2 and it continues to be attached onto the enzyme. And then it can basically pass those electrons onto the ion sulfur component of the enzyme, which passes along the remaining proteins of the electron transport chain. So this step is very important because it's essentially the link between the citric acid cycle and that oxidative phosphorylation process that takes place on the electron transport chain. Oh, and one other thing that I'd like to mention about the formation of, G of the GTP, just like in glycolysis where we had substrate level phosphorylation, this is also an example of substrate level phosphorylation where a substrate molecule is used by an enzyme to generate a high energy GTP molecule and that's in contrast to oxidative phosphorylation that takes place on the proteins of the electron transport chain. So let's finish off with step seven and step eight. So we have an oxidation reduction reaction in step six and step seven produces, or step seven is a hydration reaction. So this fumarate is transformed into a malate via a hydration reaction. So a water basically attacks or more specifically a hydroxide of the water attacks this carbon from this side and the H ion basically attaches on this side and we form the L isomer of malate. And the enzyme that catalyzes step seven is fumarase. So fumarase catalyzes the hydration of fumarate into malate. Note that the water attacks only at a specific site from this side and not anywhere else and so we only form the L isomer of the malate. So this exists in the L isomeric form. And in the final step of the citric acid cycle, we actually want to regenerate the oxaloacetate. And so the malate is oxidized into oxaloacetate by the activity of malate dehydrogenase. In the process, we abstract a hydride ion, so an H ion and two electrons, and so here we use the NAD plus to form the NADH. And the NADH uh, then can be used by the electron transport chain. Now, one thing I want to mention briefly about this step eight is it's actually a very endergonic step. It actually requires energy. And so what happens is several processes that take place in the citric acid cycle and on the lac trans uh, transport chain are actually used to power, to couple this particular process. For instance, step one of the citric acid cycle that takes place as soon as we produce oxaloacetate is actually used to drive this particular reaction forward. In addition, the NADH molecules, which are oxidized along the proteins of the electron transport chain, those reactions are also used to actually drive this particular reaction forward. So these are the four remaining steps of the citric acid cycle.